Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, Pascal and her team for, first of all, organizing this, uh, this uh, conference and for asking me to come and give you a talk. So I'd be very happy to talk about the kinds of things we've been doing. But I want to make a link with what's going to be discussed later on today. Um, for instance, I know that some people will be talking about uh, how people can move around in uh, urban environments. And this is a critical and very important thing for us, as you know, uh, population is still growing and it's growing, it's getting older and older. So we want to do something to assure that these people are not hindered in their in their uh, when they move about. But if you think about that problem, that problem is is really one that has uh, for the perceptual system is quite complicated, because when you're confronted with dense populations, dense crowds. You have a lot of information. Uh, there are a lot of people moving about. There are a lot of individual moments, little individual movements. People across pass in front of the other. You lose track. This is a very complex thing. Also, you have to integrate the information over a very large area. And you have to also temporally integrate that. So that kind of perceptual cognitive processing that you do when you move about in crowds is the kind of thing we study in the lab. Now, another thing that we're very interested in in the lab is the impact of subtle changes, subtle neurobiological changes to the system. Healthy aging is a good example of that. Very subtle changes, but it has some influences, it has an impact on how you process information. So we're interested in how you process that kind of information, let's say in the crowd, and then how these subtle changes will impact that processing. But once we've done that, there's a third step. We'd like to make you improve on these particular functions. So we're going to look at that today and see whether that is possible. Uh, well, let's start with the aging process. Okay. Um, we know now from the work, that we've, some of the work we've done in the lab, that um, the older people have a harder time processing complex visual information. Okay? The crowd example is a good example of that. Now, you take somebody at home, they'll walk very easily from the kitchen to the living room. It, no, no hesitation, very smooth gait. You take that same person, you put it on the corner of a busy street, and often they will freeze, they will hesitate. And that's because there's a lot of information to process. So we know complexity is a problem. Another thing is we know that speed is a problem. So time, reaction time, and, and making decisions in the context of these complex environments is not a simple thing. So if you add those two together, uh, you, th you can imagine that <clears throat> crowd dynamics is a complicated thing. So like I said before, if you have people moving about, the movement is not necessarily fluid. Okay, you have a, a general sense of where the people is, are going. You have a general sense of where the crowd is moving. It's a bit like watching the trees and the leaves, you see. You can watch individual leaves. The individual leaves is moving a certain way, but the tree, the wind is blowing, as you know, in a particular direction. And the fact that you see the wind blowing in a particular direction is because you're integrating those individual little movements and you're making a calculation of how things is, where, where the, the wind is blowing in a, in a general sense. So we have to do a lot of what we call spatial temporal integration. Things are happening very fast. Even if a crowd is moving slowly, there are sudden changes, sudden bifurcations. Somebody is avoiding a particular uh, a rock or, or an object, for instance. And there are multiple elements to track. Now, the example I like to give is the example with children. Everybody who has children knows it's not easy to track your kids when you go to the shopping center or when you're downtown. If you have two children and they go in opposite directions, you have to keep track of these two. That's very difficult. You're distributing your attention on multiple elements. So these are all things that are very difficult for the older population. So let's, let's try to see how we can sort of isolate this and create something uh, that we can actually test and, and evaluate the ability on. So <clears throat> if we look at uh, multiple object tracking, and we make the analogy with the, with the crowd movement, then we can ask people to sort of track these multiple elements. And then the, we activate these multiple elements. And after 
all of this moves in different speeds and different uh, with different occlusion uh, conditions, we ask them to say, okay, which are, were the ones you were tracking? Okay, that sounds very simple to do, but it's very hard to do. And if you push this at extremes, if you push the person to do it faster and faster, that's very hard. So let's look at the uh, uh, environment that we use to assess these kinds of, uh, of uh, tasks. Well, first we use virtual environments, immersive environments. And the reason is because we can maintain the perspective of, of the individual. So in these environments, you have, first of all, large visual field, which is critical, as we said before, because if I'm looking at a crowd, I'm looking at movements in a crowd, there is a lot going on, but I'm integrating over the large field. It's not like watching a television movie. Second of all, when I move my head around and I, display, you know, I have different uh, points of regard, points of, uh, of visualization, uh, the, the images on my eyes change, and uh, they must be calculated and changed as a function of that. That's what we do in the virtual environment. And plus, there's stereoscopy and all sorts of other features that are analogous to the real situation. So let's take the basic methodology. Um, we first place the person in a, in a comfortable position, but there are many. Now we have people standing on their feet, uh, jumping up and down. We have all sorts of tasks that, that we ask the people. But generally speaking, you want them to be relaxed, looking at this, and concentrating. So we have them sitting down. We present them with a certain number of elements or spheres in a 3D volume space. And then we identify some, a subset of these spheres. The example that's given here is, five, is four, four elements, four spheres, that are turning red. And then they become yellow again. And then the movement starts, the dancing starts, the crossing over starts, a bit like the crowd movement, a bit like the kind of movement you see during sports activities when you're dealing with information. And then everything halts, and I ask you, or the subject, to tell me which were the spheres that the, the subject was tracking. So, do you want to try it? Are you ready to try this exercise? <laughs> yeah? Oh, I heard a big yes. I love that. So, what's going to come next is you're going to see the spheres, and I will ask you to keep your fixation in the center, and there's a good reason for that, because if you start tracking one of the balls or one of the spheres, you're going to lose the others. Okay? It's not a good strategy in this particular case. So, I'm giving you a hint. Stay in the center, fixate that spot, and then the dancing is going to start, and in the end, you're going to have to tell me which were the four spheres, four spheres, that I identified. And normally, in the task that we do, in the training process that we do, if you don't get it right, in other words, if you get three out of four, it's not good enough. Sorry. Then we go slower. Now, if you can do four out of four, that's pretty good. We go faster. Okay? And if you get those, the next one, you get four again, we go even faster. And we're pushing people to do things faster and faster and faster speeds. Okay? And as you'll see from the results that we have, this really works, and people can get better at this task. So are you ready? <laughs> Fixate in the center now. Here we go. Keep those four balls in mind. Keep the four balls in mind. Okay, which balls were, which spheres were, come on, come on, get at least one or two of them. Here we are, we're giving you a little perspective, there we go, three, four, five, and eight. Now, that was easy. So let's try a slightly faster speed. Fixate in the center. Okay, here we go. Which spheres? Okay. So it's five, six, one, seven. And just to push the limits, let's do at a third speed. And I'm doing this for a reason. I'm doing this for a reason. The reason is that this is actually slow for some of the people we train. So normally people start at levels that are 
you know, obviously adequate and comparable to you for the most part. But once we train them and we ask them to, you know, do this exercise for a certain amount of time, they actually get better and better at it. Now, what's really exciting is that different populations do differently, but they all improve. Now, let's go back for half a second and talk about the stereoscopy, the binocular three-dimensional information we get. And the reason is that there's still some debate out there as to what is the real uh, um, usefulness of 3D. Is it just a fad? Are we just presenting things in 3D because it's nice and we get a nice, nice process? But from a performance point of view is really the critical point here. If we don't need to present in 3D, why should we present in 3D and use a virtual environment? We can probably do this on a flat screen, although we need a very large flat screen for the reasons I mentioned before. But the reason is very obvious here. When we do what we do, which is measure speed thresholds, okay, we find that every single condition that we've tried, there is a clear advantage of having stereoscopy. So somehow, the 3D, binocular 3D information that you have in this kind of environment helps you disentangle the elements in this very complex and, and, and dense maze that we're looking at. So that's critical, and that's why we do it in three dimensions. So what about training? Um, brain plasticity is a wonderful thing. There's been a lot of work in neuroscience now showing that the brain is very plastic. But there's also all sorts of movements. People train on certain things and then wonder really if it transfer over, over to other things. So the key point I will try to make here is that you want to train something that's as close as possible to the fundamental property that is critical for what you are doing. Remember the example I gave, which is crowd dynamics. Well, this is as close as you can get to crowd dynamics without making the environment too complicated. Of course, we can put individuals, we can put people, but then things get a little out of hand, and it's hard to isolate what you're trying to process and what you're trying to train, essentially. So the question, therefore, is do the older people that have more difficulty than the younger people in these kinds of environments, can they do better? Can we do something about it once we've measured it? Same with the, the young adults. Why not? If, if the older people can get better, why not the young ones? Or are they hit at a ceiling? So these are questions we've dealt with. I apologize with the slides, complicated. But uh, let me just summarize it very briefly. Uh, we did a training program in, in the lab, and we did different groups, and we had some people coming once a week for five weeks. And we had a group of young people, a group of older people, and what we find is that everybody gets better. So if you look at the red circles, I want you to focus on the red circles, the red uh, ellipse. What you find is that the older observer with no training, obviously, it, five weeks later, these are results five weeks after five weeks of training in four groups. What you find is the older do get better, significantly better. Okay. What you find is the young ones get better too, so that's encouraging. There's some room. There's a lot of flexibility to work with. But what's really key, I think, is that the um, older observers, once they were trained after five weeks, were identical, statistically identical in value, to the young untrained observers. So what's the results here? Well, we have clearly everybody gets better. It's interesting because now we have some kind of profiling. We can see who has more difficulty, less difficulty, and, and we can actually do something about it. And as we said, some of the older people get just as, function, just as, as uh, uh, good at this task as, as the young, untrained people. So what about high-level athletes? Now, we did a, a pilot study in the lab, testing some very high-level high athletes, world-class athletes, and the results were very, very encouraging. Based on these results, we've had communications with different teams, and now we've actually set the system uh, at Manchester United, uh, and they were willing to develop the program with us. We've been there for 10 months. And now we have nine different training programs. For instance, resistance to fatigue under uh, cognitive uh, stress, if you will, um, and all sorts of other functions, that I, some of which I cannot really talk about. But clearly, um, the gains have been very, very good. 
even though these players, the, the first league, the Premier League players, actually start a much higher level, they still get a lot better. Okay, so now they're use they, they they use these kinds of techniques to force, for instance, to 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 prime themselves before the games or to set up uh, uh, what they call game shape. Now we have installations in in, uh, in the National Hockey League, with the Penguins and and Senators and and the Canucks, and we also have with the the rugby teams and other Premier League teams and NCAA team or, or center, training center. So now the fire is caught. So let me just finish with this. Um, we think that this kind of training that really isolates some very fundamental properties that you have to deal with when you're traveling in traffic, when you're moving around in dense cities, for instance, when you're driving bicycles. Some people will talk about that this afternoon or when you're playing high-level sports, is trainable. It's isolatable. We can isolate it, and we can train it. And that's very encouraging. And we really believe that this, once you're, you're, you can capture information, you can process this kind of information more efficiently, then it has all sorts of other consequences on your psychological well-being, on your autonomy, and on different behaviors. And what's interesting is that there is really no limit to it because we've adapted and we've actually used this kind of technique with many other kinds of neurobiological alterations. For instance, concussions. You think about athletes who have a concussion. Uh, now the metrics are, you know, very subjective. And often they have to ask the player in the end to make the decision. But if you have a, a specific value, the player has its own reference value. I can do a three when I'm healthy, and now I can only do a two. It's hard to argue against. So this is, becomes a very good tool, a very good supplement to know where the person is, how the person, how the athlete is doing in this particular context. It can be used in very different contexts. I just want to say that this technology, along with three other technologies that were developed in the laboratory, were uh, licensed to a, a spin-off company via Université Montréal and Uni Univalor. They worked together and they generated a spin-off, and now the technologies will be available for all sorts of of, of uh, domain in all sorts of domains, sports, but also in, in neurosciences, medical health, and so on and so forth. So there's hope. Thank you very much.